Synoptic maps are a way of graphically mapping weather systems. We're used to seeing them on the television news as a series of lows and highs progressing through the country and the surrounding oceans. A synoptic map does this by the simple process of joining weather observations of equal atmospheric pressure with lines that we call isobars. As these lines are drawn, a map takes shape showing areas of low and high pressure. A series of these maps drawn over a period of hours and days shows these highs and lows traveling across vast areas of the continent, driving the weather towards us. As a snapshot of the current weather, the observations used to construct the map have to be recorded at the same time. They have to be time synchronous. And importantly, the more readings that are available, the more accurate and informing the maps are. These demands of timing and volume of observations could only be served by a ubiquitous and fast communication system. In the 19th century, the only tool available was the telegraph system. These requirements of volume and speed were starkly evident to early meteorologists and no more so than to the colonial Australia's resident experts, Charles Todd in South Australia, Robert Ellery in Victoria, and Henry Russell in New South Wales. Ellery was the first to experiment with synoptic maps in 1859, but he did so privately at his desk. But synoptic maps did not appear publicly until Russell's publication in the Sydney Morning Herald of February the 3rd, 1877. The vast scientific emptiness of the continent meant that the initial maps were highly regional and weren't very informative. This map can only show the weather for the southeast corner of the continent. But at conferences in 1879 and 1881, an agreement was made between the colonies to formalize weather observations and importantly, to telegraph their observations to the other colonies at appointed times. A special cheaper rate was set for these telegrams. This new system allowed each meteorologist to develop much larger synoptic maps, which gave them an image of the weather systems well beyond the limits and confines of their own colony. Here we have one of Charles Todd's maps dated 9 a.m. Monday the 17th of March 1884, which we'll use to show how telegraphy was the technology that allowed these maps to be drawn. You can see some sparse handwritten numbers on the map. These are readings of atmospheric pressure taken at time synchronous observations that are communicated by telegraph. You'll note that there are red lines, the isobars, in the southeast corner of the continent, much like the first map drawn by Russell. One isobar starts at Sydney with a reading of 0.29, which is shorthand for 30.29 hectopascals of pressure. There's no reason to explain what this means, except that it's an agreed way of expressing air pressure. Sydney is joined to a point just north of Port Augusta, which has a reading of 30.30. The arc of the line is roughly governed by the readings inland at Bathurst, Forbes, Wentworth, and Peterborough, marked as B, F, W and P on the map, if you look closely. These were probably recorded by the local postmasters or telegraphists who had been trained as weather observers. This system works only when there are enough observations to determine how one observation is connected to a similar one many kilometers away. But in areas with no observers, the lack of data is a showstopper. For instance, Coffs Harbor with a reading of 30.28 may or may not have a parrot streaky bay on the southern ocean coast of South Australia, but it would be a brave meteorologist who joins these two points together over a distance of almost 2,000 kilometers with no guiding intermediate readings. First, should they even be joined? The cost reading might have an unknown pair somewhere in the large empty portion of the map. And even if Coffs and Streaky Bay should be joined, what shape should the isobaric line take? This conundrum gets worse as you progress through the readings up the East Coast. But here goes. Let's put in the Overland Telegraph and train telegraphists to observe the weather at 9 a.m. and send the details immediately across the national network. It turns out that Alice Springs is recording a reading of 30.26. So the line might go from Coss Harbor to just north of Alice, somewhere around Barrow Creek, which you can see is the B on the map and then connect down with Streaky Bay. There's still a lot of guesswork on how the line should be drawn, and this is evident in the use of dashes instead of a solid line through the Western interior. 
If these two points can be joined, what the heck, let's get bold and draw the others. Since a combination of these lines seems to make sense, we can have a modem of confidence with the results. Then what the hell, New Zealand is part of team Australia, so uh, let's reach across the ditch. The result is that in the early 1880s, Australian meteorologists, meteorologists were drawing synoptic charts that were largest in the world. They covered an area the size of Europe and were larger than maps produced at the time by the United States Weather Service. This was all thanks to the data sent by the telegraphists of the overland line. And to be fair, we should recognize their compatriots working on the east-west line between South Australia and Western Australia, which was completed six years after the OT. They provided the all important readings along the bite that brought Western Australia into the system. Today, the international meteorological community is able to draw single synoptic maps for the whole globe. The first of these was formally produced for the International Geophysical Year of 1957. Now, global synoptic maps can be produced automatically, almost on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, sourcing the required data from international data repositories that are filled with millions of observations per second by an array of communication technologies that descended from the telegraph.